to Ephesians chapter 1. I always really enjoy starting a study of a new book of the Bible. I have noticed, and I've mentioned to some of you, it seems that uh, a lot of the times, series that we're in here at church, they all tend to end within about a week or two weeks of each other, and that is not by design. It just kind of happens that way. Sometimes I I don't know how long the series will be or how long it will take to work through a book of the Bible. And so we have just started this morning in Sunday school. We started into a new study of change into his image, and I trust that will be a blessing to you. And now, here on Sunday evening, we finished up last Sunday evening, we finished up 2 Samuel. And now we are going to go into the book of Ephesians. Our pattern for our studies on Sunday evenings have been, uh, so far, we go through, typically, we'll go through an Old Testament narrative book, and then when we finish that, we'll go into a New Testament, New Testament doctrinal book. And it keeps us, keeps us balanced, it keeps us grounded in all of the truth that God gives us in his word. Uh, the Apostle Paul was able to say to the Ephesians, actually, in Acts chapter 20, that he had not shunned to declare unto them the whole counsel of God, meaning if it's there, I gave it to you. That's really been my goal as a pastor is to give all the counsel of God. If you preach through the books, uh, you, you end up touching a lot of the, the subjects that sometimes get pushed to the side. And so we want to deal with all of the counsel of God. And so this evening, we are going to begin an expository study through Ephesians. Expository simply means that we're going to go through each verse. We're going to handle it verse by verse, and sometimes we're going to handle it word by word as we go through, because our highest goal in Bible study is to know when we're finished exactly what it says. Now, we are going to spend some time in Ephesians. I don't know how long it's going to take us to go through the book, but when we get done, we could just as easily flip back to the beginning and start over again, and we could go through it again, and we would get more. That's just the way that the Bible is. The Bible is a living book. It's, it's alive. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And the, the Holy Spirit always takes God's word and applies it to our lives differently as we go through it. I don't know if you've, if you've read through the Bible once. It's, it's great. You read through it again, you get more. You read through it again, and you, you get still more. That's just the way the book is, and I'm thankful for it. Ephesians, though, has been called, one, one commentator, J. Armitage Robinson, called Ephesians the crown of St. Paul's writings. He thought very highly of the book of Ephesians, and it really is a, a blessing to read through. As with many of Paul's epistles, the book of Ephesians naturally divides into two portions. In the case of Ephesians, it's six chapters, and it divides right in the middle. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 are doctrinal truth. And I would encourage you, sit down. It doesn't take very long to read through the entire book. Sit down and just do it in a sitting, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Chapters 1 through 3 are doctrinal. <clears throat> it's the Apostle Paul sharing truth that, uh, that the Holy Spirit was giving to him and that he was sharing with the church. Chapter four, Chapters 4, 5, and 6 are the practical application of not just the doctrine of chapters 1 through 3, but of all Christian doctrine. It's kind of a, a primer on how to live the Christian life that we have in Ephesians 4 through 6. But before we start into the actual text this evening, let me give you a little bit of the background, the context into which the epistle to the Ephesians was written. It's not a coincidence to God, though it was not something that I had planned, for us to be right where we are on Sunday mornings in the study of Acts. We've been in Ephesians the last few weeks. We've been in Ephesus looking at the Apostle Paul's ministry there. We've been, we've been going through that for some time, but let's, let's briefly review, and I'll give you a little bit more information, maybe a little bit deeper information here this evening. Let me show you. Here's a, a close-up of where it is on the map. This is the end of... Of, the, uh, of what we would call Turkey. It's Asia Minor. You see Ephesus right there in the white box. It's a port city. It's right there on the coast. This, the body of, of water here is the Aegean Sea that separates Turkey from Greece. 
in the days of the Apostle Paul had separated Asia Minor from Macedonia and Achaia. So the names have changed, but obviously the body of water is still the same. And Ephesus was a very, very important uh, town or city that was right there. <coughs> Being a port city ensured that this would be a wealthy and prosperous city because they could impose tariffs and taxes on everything that came in or went out of their, of their port as they chose to. Archaeologists have spent a great deal of time in Ephesus, and they have uncovered quite a bit of the ancient city. And I was looking through some different books that I had and looking online at different things. They have uncovered the library of Celsus. They also found the public baths, which is, that's not uncommon. There were lots of public bathhouses. The Romans typically would put these in. But there are pipes that run to this bathhouse. Earthenware pipes, if you think having Orangeburg pipe is bad, imagine what they had to work with, right? They're working with pottery. Okay? But they had earthenware pipes that would bring the water to the bathhouse. You say, well, it's not that big of a deal, they're on the coast. Well, you don't always want to take a bath in salt water, so they would bring in water and it would come in. They had an aqueduct that brought in fresh water to the city, which is uh, one of the the marvels of Roman engineering, they built these quite regularly, but it was as, as close as you could get to indoor, wa indoor plumbing with water pressure that you could get in the ancient world. Pretty amazing things that they had. There's the theater. Now, we talked about the theater this morning. That's where the mob in Acts 19, who, who formed when Demetrius and Silversmith worked him up into a frenzy, they grabbed... Gaius and Aristarchus, the companions of Paul, and rushed them into the theater. Well, here is the theater. 25,000 seats is what it is. There's all kinds of room here. It's built into the hillside, and uh, if you go online, you can find different pictures. There were buildings that were built. You see where this person is standing. There's kind of a staging area that's built up. There's much more beyond it that's not in the picture. And different buildings that were built where they could put on different productions, where they could have all different types of plays and whatnot. That's part of the city of Ephesus. And this morning, we also focused in, in our study of Acts, we talked about the temple of Artemis or the temple to Diana. One of the seven ancient wonders of the world. A truly amazing building, 127 pillars. Four and a half feet wide, each of them, and 62 and a half feet tall. So a, a, just a monumental structure that we have here. And then within the temple of Diana, or Artemis, there's the massive uh, idol, the, the massive image of the goddess <coughs> seated on a throne. This is an artist's rendition of what it would have looked like in the days of the Apostle Paul, and this is what it looks like today. So... Uh, it's gotten run down a bit, as you can tell, but it's it's still, you can kind of get an idea of the grandeur that once was there. And so uh, a lot of it, if you, if you read, a lot of the temple of Diana was torn down and they busted the rocks up and made roads out of it. So they took one of the ancient wonders of the world and paved the streets with it, which in all honesty, it couldn't happen to a better place than a temple to a false goddess. They knocked it down. And so we don't, we don't mourn that, but the architecture would have been something to see. It was in this city that I just showed you pictures of, in this city of Ephesus, that a church was planted in a, approximately 50 AD. So 50 years, roughly, after the birth of Christ and 20, uh, 20 some years after the death of Christ. Christ, we believe, died in 32 AD, so almost 20 years after the death of Christ. So let's talk about the Ephesian church for a moment. The first mention of Ephesus in the Bible is in Acts 18. You can, if you're turned to Ephesians, if you'd like, you can turn over to Acts, and we're going to be there for a, a, a few verses. Acts 18, verse 19 says, And he came to Ephesus, he is Paul, and he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. This is Paul. He left Corinth, which is in Greece. More specifically, it's in Achaia. He, he left Corinth, and he comes to Ephesus on his way down to Jerusalem. He's traveling with the 
the tent-making couple, Priscilla and Aquila, they arrive in Ephesus. And while he's there, he, he leaves Priscilla and Aquila and he goes into the synagogue, which should come as no surprise. That's what Paul does whenever he gets to a place. But surprisingly, Paul is well received. That's not usual. Usually when the Apostle Paul goes into a city, he's, he's kind of, <laughs> they have a riot and sometimes a lot of people get saved, but there's also a big turmoil among the Jews and they usually would try to run him out of town. But in Ephesus, it was different. In Acts chapter 18, verse 20, we read, when they, this is the people in the synagogue, when they desired him to tarry longer with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. So Paul leaves. He, he has a short ministry. We don't know how long he was there this first time. Days, maybe weeks, probably not months, that he's there in Ephesus and he's working to, to share the gospel and to preach Jesus Christ. But then he travels on. He leaves and he goes down to Jerusalem. But he leaves in Corinth, he leaves Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila were originally from Rome, then they were in Corinth, that's where Paul met them, and then they went over and they, they journeyed to, to Ephesus, and then Paul left them there and went on to Jerusalem. And it's this faithful couple that very likely worked to establish the church, to, to ground the church that was started by the Apostle Paul in those days or weeks that he was there this first time. He wasn't there long. But the seed was sown, and many people heard the gospel, and, and then Paul had to go. He had to get back to Jerusalem. And so Priscilla and Aquila, they remain there in Ephesus, and they're, they're working in the harvest field, the seeds that the apostle Paul planted. Perhaps they're seeing them harvested. And the church of Ephesus, the Ephesian church, is born. Priscilla and Aquila were in Ephesus when Apollos came through. If you remember that name, we talked about it a few weeks ago on Sunday mornings. They came through, and, and it was Apollos who had been preaching only the baptism of John. And so Priscilla and Aquila, knowing all of the gospel, they pulled this very great orator named Apollos aside. They said, hey, we, we hear you're preaching, you're preaching the baptism of John. You're preaching only part of the story. Did, didn't you get the rest of it? And they tell him about Jesus Christ. They tell him the whole story of everything that happened. And he goes on and he keeps preaching. But this godly couple did a great work. They were the ones who, who worked on the ground in Ephesus with the ministry that the Apostle Paul had gotten started. They were the ones who were very instrumental in founding the church in Ephesus. On his third missionary journey, the Apostle Paul came back to Ephesus, where he remained for between two and three years. This is what we were talking about this morning in Acts 19. It's, it's the end of that period of time. But the Apostle Paul was there in Ephesus for two to three years, and he just got down in the trenches, and he was working, and he was preaching the gospel, and he was discipling believers. And he was edifying the church, and the church was getting strong. That, that was the longest that the Apostle Paul had spent in any place on any of his missionary journeys. He was usually in, and then typically, he had to leave. Not of his own accord, but the, the, the Jewish uh, mob would run him out of town. But in Ephesus, he was able to stay. And the work of God grew and prospered. During this time, they, they grew in their, their spiritual maturity, as was shown. It was in Ephesus, in Acts 19, that we read that the believers gathered together all of their magic books, took in 50,000 pieces of silver's worth, and they bring them to the town square, and they have a bonfire, because now they've got Jesus. They don't need magic. And so uh, they, they, we see growth. Eventually, the church in Ephesus would go on to be pastored by someone who you know. His name was Timothy. Timothy would go on and he would pastor the church in Ephesus for a period of time. The last mention of the church in Ephesus is found in Revelation chapter 2. It's one of the seven churches in Asia Minor that 
the Apostle John in his revelation from Jesus Christ. It's one of the churches, it's the first of the churches that John conveyed Christ's uh, commendation. There was much to commend in the church in Ephesus. They were busy, they were discerning, but Revelation 2 says, but I have somewhat against thee because thou hast, do you remember what it is? You left your first love. The church in Ephesus was busy, they were discerning, they had a lot going for them, but they had gotten away from the purpose behind it. They had gotten away from that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the church in Ephesus, just kind of, a, again, a very brief overview, and we'll dive down deeper on some of this as we work our way through the, through the actual epistle. So let's talk about the epistle that we have before us. Ephesians is one of four prison epistles. The prison epistles are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Those are the four that we know. The Apostle Paul was in prison when he wrote them. There's some debate as to which prison Paul was in when he wrote it because Paul spent quite a bit of time behind bars over the course of his life. It makes the most sense. If you're interested in the side theories, I can show you some of them and, and we could talk through them. But it makes the most sense to believe that the Apostle Paul wrote this epistle during his first imprisonment in Rome, which would be about 60 to 62 AD, right in that time frame. Paul had two imprisonments in Rome. The first time is when he appealed to Caesar in the book of Acts. And he was taken to Rome, and he was able to present his case, and he was, he was let go. He was released. He went back out, and he had a vibrant ministry for a very short time before his second imprisonment. He was taken by Nero and his forces, and Paul was martyred for his faith. He was beheaded on the Apian Way outside of Rome in around 64 A.D., we, we believe it happened before the great fire of Rome that Nero set, because the Apostle Paul doesn't talk about that in any of his writings. Ephesians, the epistle that we're going to look at, was likely written at the same time as Colossians and Philemon. Some believe even written in the same day. Likely written around the same time and sent by the hand of the same messenger, his name was Tychicus, to be delivered to the churches one of them in, to the church in Colossae, and Philemon was to an individual church member in Colossae, whose name was, can you guess? Philemon. Right? And, and then we have the epistle to the, to the Ephesians that came along. Ephesians, as with all of the Apostle Paul's epistles, would have been read by the church to which it was addressed, and then it would be copied very meticulously, and it would be spread around, and everybody gets to read it. It was a way of, of communicating doctrine, so this would be no exception. <clears throat> Before we get into the actual substance here, let's just give you a brief overview of the themes of Ephesians. Six times throughout the book, there are six chapters, it's not one per chapter, but six times Throughout the epistle to the Ephesians, Paul speaks of a mystery. Now, when we think of a mystery, we think of the Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew, and we think of something where you have to get your magnifying glass out and go find clues. That's not what the Bible is talking about when it speaks of a mystery. A mystery, as it's referred to in Ephesians, is not something that God is trying to hide so that we don't get. It's a truth that is revealed that takes some, it takes some consideration. It's something that, that people look at and they say, wow. And you're going to see that throughout the, the book of Ephesians. The mystery is something that is, had been previously unknown, but God revealed. That's the mystery, and, and you'll see it. In the first three chapters, Paul is going to make much of the fact that Jews and Gentiles are one in Christ. That's, that's part of the mystery. Again, because the Apostle Paul is Jew or Gentile. He's a Jew. And he's just kind of a, he's kind of a run-of-the-mill Jew, though, right? He's, he's, he's not like a fanatic, right? No, he was a fanatic when he started. He was, he was a Pharisee. 
He was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel in Jerusalem. He was, he was one of the elites. And he was one of the ones who was very opposed to the idea of, you mean that you're going to share truth with Gentiles? He would have, he would have scoffed at the idea. But now... He marvels at what he refers to as the mystery that God would open his grace, that God would open his love. God would, would open the church, not just to the Jews, but to, to the Gentiles as well. Again, I'm profoundly thankful for that fact, that God opened the gospel to the Gentiles. You'll find throughout Ephesians the themes of grace, love, Unity will be recurring, as well as different teachings regarding the church as the body of Christ. There are calls to holiness, and then when we get to Ephesians 6, Ephesians 5 is all about the family. Ephesians 6 is all about spiritual warfare. It's in Ephesians 6 that we read about the armor of God, and so we'll deal with all of that as we get there. We'll make much more of these as we go along, but I wanted to kind of give you an overview to give you the context and the city to which it's written, the, the historical backing. Let's get into the actual word here this evening, though, in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to break down some of Paul's introduction. I want you to remember as we read these first verses here in Ephesians 1 that the church in Ephesus knew the Apostle Paul more than any other church because he had spent more time with this church than with any other church that we have recorded in Scripture. If the Apostle Paul wasn't in jail in the town, he didn't usually stay around long. But he stayed in Ephesus, and because of that, the Ephesians, there was, there was a bond with the Apostle Paul that, that there wasn't perhaps in Philippi or Colossae or Galatia. But in, if, in Ephesus... They have a connection with the Apostle Paul. Verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. We look at this, <coughs> and we say, this is a little bit backwards. When you write a letter, where do you put your name? At the end, right? You put at the end, sincerely, or love, or whatever it is, however, whatever uh, word you put above your name, and then you put your name. But in this culture, it was more common to put your name at the beginning. That way, because how many of you, when you get a letter, you open it up, and what is the first thing that you look at? Who sent it, right? You want to see whose name is at the bottom. So they just took all of the hard work of having to go to the end of the letter out. They put their name at the beginning. In this case, the name, of course, is Paul. The Greek word Paulus. He used to be Saul of Tarsus. Saul and Paul. There's a lot of similarity between the names. One is, is a, a kind of a Greek form of it. So when the apostle Paul traveled through Galatia and he went to his hometown of Tarsus, it's entirely likely that they still called him Saul and that he still answered to it. Uh, because that was the name that he was given, and, and there is much similarity between Saul and Paul. The name itself means little, small, or diminutive. I mentioned to you that uh, the Apostle Paul was not reported to have been a very large man. In early writings, uh, church history, not, not scripture, but in early writings, Paul is called the man of three cubits. A cubit is 18 inches, meaning that if that is true, that the Apostle Paul stood at 4 foot 6 inches. So not a very tall man. He was, he was kind of on the shorter side. Paul was an apostle. An apostle means a delegate, an ambassador. The word actually breaks down to meaning a sent one or one who is sent on behalf of another. When we read about the apostles, we remember back to where they came from. They came from when Jesus was walking around in Galilee. He selected 12 to accompany him during his earthly ministry. In Mark 3, verse 14, we read, And he, Christ, ordained 12, that they should be with him and that he might send. That's the verb form, that he might send, apostello, that he might send them forth to preach. Jesus chose 12. Uh, we could ask you for their names, and maybe you could get them out if you're able to sing the song. <laughs> That's how a lot, of, a lot of folks remember it. Uh, 
We, we know of the 12 disciples. One of them was, as Jesus said, a devil, right? One of them was, was not good, Judas Iscariot. Luke 6, verse 13 says, And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve whom he named apostles. So that's where the name came from. That's where these men got their name. There were twelve original apostles following the death of Judas Iscariot, which we read about in Acts chapter 1. Another apostle was appointed. His name was Matthias. Matthias was chosen by the 11 remaining apostles to take the, the vacated office of Judas Iscariot. The purpose of the office of the apostle, it, exactly as the name has in mind, they were sent. They were sent by Christ for a purpose. They were sent, and the, the purpose, the office of the apostle existed, was these men were to lay the foundation of the early church upon the teachings of Christ. For this reason, the apostles were given gifts. We talked a few weeks ago on Sunday morning about how the apostle Paul, when he was in Ephesus, they would take his handkerchief or his 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 sweat rag is what it is, and they would take it and and they would lay it on a sick person and that person would be healed. We read in in the book of Acts about the apostles raising the dead and casting demons out and healing blind people, all of those were sign gifts to validate the message of the apostles. All of those, all of those miracles pointed people towards Jesus Christ. And all of those messages, all of those, those miracles validated the message of the one who was performing the miracles. Why should anybody listen to a four foot six Jewish man wandering around a Gentile town telling people about a, ca a carpenter in Nazareth? Well, they wouldn't, except that little guy, he's, he's walking up to people who can't walk and they walk away from him. He walks up to blind people and heals them. They're able to see. These sign gifts that the apostles had furthered the cause of Christ. All of the apostles according to Acts 1.22, were visual witnesses of the resurrected Christ. And for that reason, primarily, we can say that there are no apostles walking around on planet Earth today. Though there are many who would declare themselves to be so. There are, if you look around, if you look at the phone book, you'll find that there are churches that claim to be apostolic churches, and they claim that uh, their, their pastor is not just a pastor, he's an apostle. But He's not because he doesn't have meet the requirements that are laid out for us in Acts chapter 1 of an apostle. The apostles are only those who have seen the risen Christ. Now God still sends messengers. If you're saved, he sends you. God still sends messengers to, to share the gospel, but the last to hold the office of apostle was John who died during his writing of the Revelation, or at the end of his writing of the Revelation, likely sometime at or just after 98 AD. So there hasn't been an apostle walk on planet Earth for well over 1,000 years, almost 2,000 years total of, of time that we have. In most of his epistles, Paul calls himself an apostle. It's not true in all of them, but in almost all of them. Paul just kind of proud. Just, just a guy who he, he, he thinks quite a bit of himself. So he likes, to, he likes to lead with the fact that he's an apostle. Is that what he's doing? Is this rooted in pride? No. When the apostle Paul speaks and he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, he's establishing his authority. That's why when, when the doctor comes into the room and he's talking with you, you want to know that this is a man who actually has some authority to speak. This guy has done his study. This is a man who's qualified to speak. Well, when the Apostle Paul says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, he's establishing his credentials. He's saying, I have the authority to speak that is given to me from on high. You should hear what I have to say, not because I'm something special. And the Apostle Paul would be the first to tell you that he wasn't something special. It's only through Christ, but you should listen because God has given me the message that I'm about to give you. 
His calling to apostleship was different than the other apostles. It was much later than the other apostles. But no less effective or authoritative. His calling, he says here, is by the will of God. And he's writing to the saints which are at Ephesus. We've kept away from the word saint an awful lot in our modern usage because of its misuse by the, by the Catholic Church. The Catholics have a process called canonization. That sounds violent, but it's not. Canonization is the process by which a member of the Catholic Church is examined, and when they meet the requirements of a saint, they can receive the title. They're typically already gone. They're typically dead uh, when they get this. They have to check out their writings and make sure that they agree with Catholic dogma. They have to, have, they have to be credited with at least one miracle. Only after meeting the requirements of the Catholic Church can one be beatified. That's the word that they use, which they are declared blessed, and they're made an official saint of the Catholic Church. And there are lots of saints in the Catholic Church. The biblical process of becoming a saint is far less corrupt, corrupt and, and far less complicated. Saint means pure, morally blameless, holy seems like a harder hurdle to clear than performing a miracle, doesn't it? So, so in order to be a saint, all you have to be is righteous. All you have to be is holy. You good? How many saints do we have a month? Well, we'd all, we, if, if that was all we knew, we'd say, oh, I don't think anybody's a saint. If that's how we're defining it, let me give you a couple verses. Philippians 3.9 says, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Well, if we, if we look at it that way, I can have Christ's righteousness. I'm not righteous in and of myself. I'm unrighteous because all have sinned. But in Christ, well, that, that changes everything. Romans 5, 1 says, therefore being justified. What's justified mean? It means declared righteous Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness. Do you remember the song we started the service with? Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness this very hour. That's where this comes from. I can have righteousness. I can say to you right now that in the eyes of Almighty God, I am as righteous as Christ is righteous because I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Because the righteousness of Christ has been credited to my account. Because he took my sin, he gave me his righteousness. So all of us who have been saved by grace through faith, are labeled saints, according to Scripture. So you could very legitimately, though perhaps a bit awkwardly, come up and greet St. Barry after the service. And, and again, it would be awkward, but just because of how we associate the word, but it's true. We are saints in Christ. We have, have received all of the righteousness of Christ credited to our account, making us holy blameless, righteous, just like Christ before the Father. Paul is writing the, writing the book of Ephesians to believers, to saints, and to the faithful, literally the believing ones in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, and we'll close with this. He says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. In every one of his epistles, Paul says these words. This is how he opens. He says, grace and peace. Grace is the Greek word charis. It means generosity unmotivated by the worthiness of the recipient, or we would say unmerited favor. This grace is God's undeserved, unmerited favor bestowed upon ungodly sinners. For by grace... Are ye saved through faith? That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Grace is how we are saved. And 
what follows grace? Peace. Peace, the word is Irene, from where we get the name Irene, means rest, quietness, harmony, accord. Peace is the natural byproduct of grace. If you have received the grace of God, if you've received salvation, then you can have peace. Why don't we switch them? Why don't we say peace and grace? Well, because peace only goes where grace already resides. You only have true peace if you're in Christ. You can't have peace without grace. One commentator says it this way, grace is positional. Peace is is practical, and together they flow from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. Grace and peace. If you've received Christ as your Savior, if you are in fact a saint, verse 1, then you can have peace. And again, who's he speaking on the behalf of? Of our Lord Jesus Christ. God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're going to stop there because... If you look ahead, verses 3 to 6 are all one sentence, and so I'm not going to try to break those up uh, here this evening. We're out of time. So we're going to end with just an introduction and then Paul's greeting. But Paul does not waste any time getting into amazing truth. If you read, just if you, if you go home this evening and you read just, just verses 3, 4, 5, and 6, you'll be blessed. There's tremendous truth, tremendous positional truth, for each and every one of us. It's practical truth, though. It applies to you tonight. It applies to you tomorrow. The things that we're going to be looking at, they're, they're blessings that you'll take with you throughout the week. But this evening, rejoice in your title. You can't be an apostle, but you can be a saint. You can be a saint, and you can thank God for the peace that always follows his grace. Thank God for these things. Let's bow for a word of prayer this evening. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how applicable it is to the lives that we lead. Lord, we thank you that we can be righteous, that we can be holy before you because of the sacrifice of your son. Father, we pray that we would live up to, in practicality, what is already true position. I pray that you would help us, Lord, as we go through this study. I pray that you'd speak to our hearts. I pray that we would understand truth that, that perhaps has been in darkness for us before now. I pray that we would see your face in this epistle to the church in Ephesus, written all those years ago, but still viable, still applicable today. Lord, I pray you'd be with each and every one who's here tonight. I pray that you would give us a good week ahead. Be with those who can't be with us for one reason or the other. I pray that you give them health, strength, safety, wherever they happen to be, and bring us all back together at the next point in time. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ.